Hey, this is Andy Dowling from the metal band Lord and host of the Andy Social Podcast. You are watching the Chana 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 Podcast. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have very special guest today joining all the way from Sydney, Australia. We got Andy Dowling joining the podcast. Hi Andy. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, so how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh it's Sunday afternoon here and I've been doing some podcasting myself. So I've been talking all day and uh I'm all fired up ready for a great conversation with you. right i as i was telling you before before we start recording that it's always exciting to talk to another podcaster <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah the other thing is i know that when you're talking to a podcaster he's going to be ready for the podcast right i know that he's going to have like a great setup and he he's going to sound great and he knows where the you know position the camera and everything so it's so exciting <laughs> <laughs> right so so andy how is uh, how is sydney these days because we are hearing you know in the news it's it's like very serious lockdown in australia and how is the life there these days um yeah it's been a little bit tough um over the past few months it's been we've been in a lockdown in sydney uh, so we haven't been able to uh go to the shops or go to bars or anywhere that you would uh meet in groups of people so um I live right in the city right in the middle of Sydney and we've been allowed to go for walks and exercise and and uh go and buy a coffee or something like that but you can't go into any any shops or other people's homes so it's been like that right, for 3 right. months so it's been a long time but um tomorrow as of tomorrow they're going to start uh, allowing people to go back out again and go to shops and to bars and restaurants so I'm looking forward to having a beer tomorrow I I'm, I can't wait Right, right, right. So, so how did how did the pandemic affected you, like personally, on on what you're doing? Yeah, it. Uh, so, playing in the band, uh, we had a lot of shows that were planned. Um, in actually, we had some shows in Singapore, in Southeast Asia, uh, in Europe that we were looking to set up as well, and in our own country here in Australia. And of course, like every other band, they all got cancelled. And we thought, oh, maybe it'll just be a few months. and then it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. So um so that was tough, but we we've used the time really well. We've we've recorded a lot of music and put some albums out, some releases in that in that time. So that's been really good. Um but I've been one of the lucky ones. I've still been able to do podcasting, which is great. We can talk with anybody all over the world and and I've been able to sort of uh stay creative and and stay sane during this time. So there's been lots of people that have uh, been very uh sort of negatively impacted by uh by the pandemic but i've been i think one of the lucky ones right right yeah because i actually i actually started this podcast also because of the pandemic so because yeah. i i couldn't go to concerts anymore so i thought let me just start talking to people about the experience of going to concerts and stuff so it started with fans but eventually you know artists were interested also to talk so then it became a uh sort of a thing and then i sort of found a purpose of doing it because you know we are able to talk about these frustrations we have all the and and also this mental health thing came up very frequently on the discussions like a lot of people are going through all these problems right yeah yeah it's a great and it's a great idea that you've done it because i think it's a it's a good way to connect with people i think uh the past year or so it's been really tough for people's mental health um because you know we sometimes feel like we've got all these challenges but then we realize everybody else has got a challenge we're all in the same thing right. it's, it's hard to it's it's hard to connect with people sometimes so podcasting's really good because you get to listen to conversations or you get to have them which is even better um and uh i think it's helped a lot of people get through some dark to- dark times over the past few months so it's been good so thank you to you for for having a podcast uh, i think i think it's a great service for a lot of other people right so so I think 5 years ago 5 years ago I I was actually in Sydney and uh, it's a I think I stayed there for like two and a half weeks uh and I stayed in North Sydney where I could oversee the bridge Sydney bridge I think there is like like this uh 
carnival or something like like a theme park near the bridge right so my hotel was like there i could just walk to the sea it's like very near to the so i really enjoyed that the the place and then i was able to go and see some of the bands uh, local sydney bands uh and it it it's been a very memorable place for me and i i hope it sydney is still amazing it it is and um that that park that was near you is called Luna Park and right, uh, right, right. it's all the, the rides and, and the Ferris wheel and, and all of that. And uh, it's an amazing place uh, where, where you were staying and uh, where I live is just almost the opposite on the other side of the water in Piermont. So I'm right. really, really close to where you were staying and uh, it's, I mean, it's still a beautiful place. Uh, I'm really lucky and fortunate to live where I live. And I think, as we come out of the pandemic and for us, it's, it's summer now. Well, summer's right around the corner. So it's not too far away. Right. I think it's be a really, a really positive time because people are going to be really happy to finally get out and socialize and be with other people. And yeah, I think the, the Sydney Harbor is going to be very energetic. Uh, lots of people are going to be out. So it'd be a lot of fun. Right, right, right. Um, so, so Andy, you, you were born in Sydney or, or you, you were raised in Sydney. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, sure. And I, um, I actually was born in a place called Redcliffe, which is uh, just near Brisbane. Uh, so about, so if uh, sort of geography, it's about 10 hours drive north of Sydney. So as you know, right. uh, it's quite, quite a large country, a lot of space in between. And uh, I moved to Sydney about, ooh, about 15 years ago. And it was to do what I'm doing. I'm um, playing a band and um, the rest of the band were all, living in Sydney or, or near Sydney. And so I thought if I want to be in this band, I'm going to have to move. And, uh, and I didn't expect to be in Sydney for long. I didn't think it would work out. I thought maybe I'd be here for a few months and then go home back to Brisbane. Um, and here I am 15 odd years later and I'm, I haven't left. <laughs> so it's, it's been really good, but, uh, yeah. So, um, growing up in Queensland in, in Brisbane and, uh, um, always been musical, uh, played the trumpet as a kid and then uh, eventually discovered rock music. So I went to the guitar and, and eventually I wanted to play in a band, but then everyone played guitar and right. I got into a band, but no one wanted to play bass guitar. So I thought, well, <laughs> this is my way of getting into a band. So I picked up the bass guitar and I still play it to this day. And it's been a, a great way to, to, to play in bands. So it's been really good. <laughs> so so what sort of what sort of bands and artists just like music introduce you to rock rock and metal i think a very it's very similar to a lot of other uh musicians especially metal musicians uh metallic is probably the the, the big one i think when right. i first heard metallic i went oh wow my life has changed forever like what is this amazing music and then i think it sort of went off in different directions but i mean i i think the first big show I ever saw was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I remember seeing them live and, and a little bit weird to say that so many years later, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the yeah. electricity in the arena and so many people there. And, and I'm just, and I was just a young kid and I'm looking at this band playing on stage and just everyone enjoying it. I thought, I just thought, I want to do that. I think that looks so cool. And, uh, and, and it sort of went from there. So, um, but I think, yeah, all, all the, all the big rock bands and, and metal bands um, were, were some of those early, early childhood uh, sort of uh, inspirations and, and the sort of motivation for me to pick up a guitar in the first place. So yeah, it's been, been really cool. Right. So, so which, which Metallica album did you like first picked up? Well, the first one I picked up was Injustice for All. Right. And I listened to it and I thought, and, I, and a friend traded a cassette with me, like they just dubbed. So it wasn't even an official album. It was like a bootleg. And I remember, I remember listening to it and going, I don't understand what this is. Like, it's just too complicated and the songs are really long. But I remember I liked the song One, of course, as like the popular one on the album. And then at the same time, because this, this is around the mid 90s, I got Load, which is a very different album, a lot more commercial uh, friendly. And so I really enjoyed Load because I was still getting into music. So I liked the melody and the catchiness of the songs. And then once I understood Metallica, then I went back and went back to Injustice for All and went, ah, oh, this is so much better. I love right. this. And I went back to all the old albums and then, and then just went from there. So yeah, a little bit of a weird way of, of getting into the band, but um, I've always been a big fan. Yeah, I have the same experience because I actually first got Load and, and there were a lot of 
I, I I mean, in Lord album, they had like a lot of ex- excellent music videos, right? Like remember the house that Jack built, King Nothing, and all all of those music videos were amazing. And then I remember in Lord, the first song was "Ate My Bitch," right? So that <laughs> that was like, a, but then I I went back and started like getting Kill 'Em All, then you know all of that albums. Then, but one Metallica album that I I really uh, very close to me is the compilation album they did, the Garage Inc. Yeah. Because that album is sort of, I think it's an album that really opened me up to other genres of music. Like they had like, you know, all the hardcore covers, they had the punk covers of Misfits, Bob Seger and all this, right? So it really opened me up to go and explore other mu- music. So I think that album was very special for me in that sense. I think I think nobody else really done that sort of thing, right? Where they took all these genres and they made it their own. It oh, was a special album for me. No, same same for me. Uh, I didn't discover a lot of those bands until Metallica covered them on that album. Right. Um, right. Blue, Blue Oyster Cult and... And even like some of the metal stuff that I just hadn't quite got to yet, like Merciful Fate, King Diamond, you know, listening to that sort of stuff through Metallica, through Metallica's sound. Yeah. And then I went back and listened to to the originals and really appreciated some of these, some of these artists and, and bands. Uh, so yeah, I'm the same. Uh, and it was amazing. I think it was a, a groundbreaking album of, of cover songs that, that really got the next generation of music fans into the history of music it was it was a really well done uh compilation that they put out yeah and then the like the song like turn the page like i don't think i think after that it became metallica song right oh yeah it's, it's not a bob seger song anymore uh, no, it's definitely a metallica song and they and that, that was the great thing about their covers is that it, they're so distinctive in their sound and 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 het filled with these vocals these really you know raspy sort of trademark vocals and their their heavy guitars and they were able to make yeah, make those songs their own, whether it be Merciful Fates or Black Sabbath. I mean, if you hear the Black Sabbath med- medley that they did, um, incredible. Um, yeah. And it's definitely, it's it, yeah, they, they made those songs their own. Right. Um, so, so Andy, so, uh, you know, what were your like earlier band? You, did you have bands, bands in school or tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I... When I was still in school, I had some friends that also played guitar and drums and we used to get together and just try to play songs, but we weren't really good. So we just played a couple of riffs here and there, but we couldn't actually get through a whole song. We'd sort of give up. So it was very, um, very beginner. We were just sort of getting used to sort of playing, playing together. Uh, But it wasn't until I finished school that I, um, just going back to what I said earlier, like I, I realized that everyone was a guitar player and it was so hard to get into a band or start one when there were so many guitarists and I thought I was okay, but I wasn't a, an amazing guitar player, but everyone was looking for a bass player. No one to play bass. So I just thought I'm going to, I'm going to buy a bass and just learn how to play some basic stuff on, on bass and see if I can get into a band. And, uh, and I did, I, I joined a band called uh, sedition, which were like a power metal iron maiden Queens, kind of band in, in Brisbane. And I was with them for a little while. And I also played in a, for a very short uh, period of time, I played for a, a hard rock band in Brisbane called Mobster. And they were very like 80s hard rock kind of stuff. Um, Van Halen sort of sounds and a, a little bit of deep purple in there as well. Um, and it was really cool. It was just uh, fun, fun up, sort of up-tempo music. And through those guys, I'd sort of um, developed a lot of friendships in the music scene in Brisbane, which then... Um, sort of led me to uh, discover a lot of bands that lived in other parts of Australia. And then through networking, eventually uh, found the band that I've been in for the last yeah, 15, 16 years. So, uh, yeah. Right. Right. So you, you mentioned that you, your first show that you watch is uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? So, so I think Flea is like one of the greatest bass players of all time. Right. So uh who else? Who else do you look up to with regards to bass? Yeah, uh, so a few. So I think a very obvious one's Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. I think just mm. he, the runs, the bass runs that he that he plays in in a lot of his stuff, especially uh, Dio era Sabbath. I think Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. If the right. bass runs in in that are just out of this world. I just absolutely love them. And so I've got a lot of respect and I've had a lot of inspiration from, from him. 
Um, I think from a more flamboyant and like performer sort of perspective, uh, Kip Winger, I think he's an amazing musician an amazing vocalist um and yes you know a very cheesy band but they had some great songs but him on stage with that with that headpiece the little headpiece and his bass up here and he's spinning around i just thought that was so cool um and then also in that same that same sort of uh bucket would be rick savage from def leopard i thought he just oozed that coolness with the bass and he sort of he'd sort of lurk around on stage you know pulling all these these shapes and these poses and everything i always thought he looked awesome and um I'm just trying to think there's this. Oh, and uh, Eddie Jackson from, uh, from Queens rock as well. Um, just an amazing solid bass player. Uh, really, really have enjoyed his, uh, his playing and something that, especially when I joined uh, Lord, um, I sort of, we were playing a lot more stuff that was more heavily influenced by Queens rock. So I, I kind of went back to Queens rock and listened to a lot of his playing. And, and I think I sort of naturally picked up a lot of his stuff uh, through my playing as well. Right. So, so, so to everyone who doesn't know what the band Lord is, can you tell me a little bit about the history of the band and, and also how you discovered that band? Yeah, sure. So Lord, uh, so there's two eras of the band and the band used to be called Dungeon and Dungeon was formed in 1989 in a place called Broken Hill. And Broken Hill is about... If you were going to drive, it'd be about 13, 14 hours west of Sydney. It's in the middle of nowhere. And anybody right. who's seen the movies Mad Max, the original Mad Max movies, they were filmed <laughs> out there in the middle of nowhere. All right. you know, think about the, the desert and all those, those, those sort of futuristic sort of apocalyptic trucks driving around, everything like that. That's kind of what Broken Hill is um, or, or near Broken Hill. So uh, Tim, our singer, he formed the band, uh, formed the band Dungeon out there. And uh, in the mid nineties, moved to Sydney with, a, with another friend of his and uh, continued the band Dungeon there. And uh, the band did really well. Um, one, of the, one of the more popular metal bands in Australia for, for quite a number of years. And uh, towards the end of 2005, uh, there was some uh, member changes within the band and Tim had decided that he wanted a new chapter and start afresh. So he thought he'd change the name from Dungeon to Lord. And Tim's uh, stage name is Lord Tim as well. So he's right. used Lord Tim, so calling it Lord. And uh, for me, like when I came into it, I'd been a big Dungeon fan. I'd loved Dungeon uh, since the early 2000s when I started getting into music. And I used to go to their shows. And uh, in 2005, the guys were about to go to Europe and play a bunch of shows in Europe. And I was going to go and go to a bunch of festivals and do the whole summer metal sort of uh, season in uh in in europe and so i said to them oh can i come along with you guys i'll i might just i'll be your beer roadie i'll carry your beers for you or i'll do something i'll carry your guitars right and uh and they were sort of like oh i don't know and then eventually they said okay okay you can come along and then what we found out in the meantime is they actually got offered to support megadeth in europe um at that time so i ended up going with dungeon while they supported megadeth in in europe in 2005 and i was the light guy i was at the lighting desk hitting wow. all the all the buttons as, as they're playing and um, had an amazing experience. And it was towards the end of that tour that um, I picked up the bass player's guitar at the time. And I was just noodling around on it. And Tim looked at me and goes, Oh, you can play. And I go, Oh yeah, kind of, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and so he just, he just had a thought and he left it there. And then when the band started to break up a little bit, um, he reached out to me and said, do you want to, do you want to join the band? And I went, Oh, Okay. All right. And so, as I said earlier, I was living in Brisbane, so I had to pack up and, and move, move down to Sydney and, um, and then, yeah. So um, Lord's been up and running since the end of uh, 2005 and we've been um, so just continuing on with the momentum from dungeon. We've released, um, Oh geez. Um, I'm going to get this wrong. Maybe five studio albums, about five or six EPs. Um, we've done a couple of live albums um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. We, we haven't stopped over the past sort of 15 odd years, um, toured North America, Europe, Southeast Asia, um, of course, Australia as well, Japan, uh, New Zealand. So, um, we've been, we've been very busy over the years and we've been really fortunate to have a lot of great opportunities. So it's been, been fun. Right. Right. Um, so Andy, uh, as much as you are a bass player, you're also a podcaster. So, so 
when did you like first heard the term podcast like yeah it's a bit of a weird name isn't it if you think about yeah. it what is a podcast <laughs> such a weird name uh i think in australia we had a we've got a radio uh network called the abc and i think in the 90s they had something called a podcast but i never knew what it was it was kind of like a weird name and, and they used to always say at the end of the radio program you can listen to the podcast on abc.com or abc.net or whatever but it wasn't until and I, I i remember that but i sort of disregarded it. i didn't really think about it but it was only um sort of in more recent years that podcasting became really popular and mm-hmm. a lot of famous podcasters and i was listening to a few here and there and um yeah that's that's when i sort of got the idea that oh maybe i could give this a go maybe i could maybe i can talk into a microphone and talk to other people i don't know i can give it a shot and right. uh and yeah I, I started doing it. it's been a lot of fun yeah um so so you basically have uh you have the andy social podcast and then you have another nod to the old school which is which is also kind of a podcast right and then self start a podcast so how how do you handle all this you know three podcasts and bands and and also you manage the social media of your band as well i know so how do you yeah. able to manage all this <laughs> uh yeah i i don't know i don't know how i do it it's 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 a lot of work and um i like i read a lot of books and i listen to a lot of podcasts uh, myself about you know self development and and trying to find ways to get better as a person and and i love all the productivity things how to be more productive and use more uh, uh make better use of your time because i think a lot of the time we find ourselves like you know we've got a phone and we find ourselves just going scroll 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 and then <laughs> like, you know 20 minutes later you're like what have i just done for the last 20 minutes and I've realized that there's a lot of time in the day to to do a lot of good things and to get a lot of stuff done. So um luckily at the moment I don't I'm not running all three podcasts at the same time. Um but at at one point in time I had everything going at the same time. So it was very important for me like on a Sunday or a Monday to schedule out my week and make sure that I knew exactly where I needed to be and who I was going to be talking to and what I was going to be doing and uh and stay to that plan um and stay to that schedule and it was really and that ensured that i could always get everything done but um yeah it i i love being busy but in a like i love being productive and i love always having something to do and i love creating stuff and and i love communicating with people as well and i think it's really enriching like i get a lot out of it and i grow as a person so and whether it be me doing my own podcast or yeah doing the social media for the band or you know i've got i've got boxes and shelves of lord cd's and vinyl and everything down here so i do all the merchandise as well right. or i could be doing a podcast with with yourself it it's all fun i love it i absolutely love it and i think that's probably a, a big thing if i didn't love it then it'd be very hard to do right um I, I, I really, I saw the books that you're posting. Like I saw, I, I think I saw Yomi Park's book also on the latest, the one that you post on the, on your page. Um, but it seems that you're reading a lot, which is something that I'm trying to really improve. Uh, yeah. I, I do buy books. I do buy books, but you know, the rate of reading it is <laughs> you know, a bit off yeah. because I, I have, I have to have this. So I, all my visits visit to the mall i always go to the bookshop it's kind of thing so i think there's there's a japanese term called tasanduku i think it's called people who buy books but don't read them <laughs> like <laughs> oh i love that <laughs> how do you how do you keep on reading how do you doesn't get distracted from you know all these stuffs happening around you <laughs> it's very it's very hard it's a really hard thing to do i i like as a kid i think it was easier because mm. and we didn't have a lot as much technology either we didn't have as many distractions and i remember as a kid i would always love reading books and so i could sit on the couch or you know in the corner of a room and have my head down in a book for for hours and and just love it and it there was no issue and i think as you're older and you know we've we've all got responsibilities and we've all got distractions in in adult life i think it's really really tough um the way that the way that i've sort of do it or I'm able to read so much now is when I've got back into reading again it was really tough like I would read and then while I'm reading I could see my phone on the desk 
you know, across from me, light up and I go, oh, I'll put the book down. I'll go over and have a look and see what this says. And I, I would just constantly be distracted, but I'd have to, it's kind of like meditation. You always got to bring yourself back to the breath. And so for right. me, it was always bringing myself back to the words and then just, and if I had to slow down, I had to slow down. And for me, it was always about, can I read two pages? So at least I can move the bookmark to the next page. Right. And that was my goal. If I could do that, then I win. And if it means that I put my book down, I don't look at it for another day, that's okay. But as long as I could just read those two pages and I kept it really simple. And then over time, I would read those two pages and go, well, I want to keep reading. I'll, I'll read the next page. Yeah. Yeah. And so it became easier. And um, I think the other thing that I've done, which has helped ha is um, I'm not a big exercise person. I, I wish I was, but I'm not. But I always try to do my 10,000 steps a day. Right. And for what I do at home some days, especially if it's raining and I can't really go outside, is I will walk around my home with a book <laughs> with my phone in my pocket to get my steps and I'll keep walking around. And it's a great motivator for me because I can read. I'm absorbed in the story. I'm getting the steps. So I feel productive and it's just enough for me to not be distracted and it works really well, but it is a tough thing. And I know it's, I think a lot of people gravitate towards audiobooks these days rather than read. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, I, there's something I really enjoy now. I'm holding a book and reading it and then when i'm finished like you know putting it behind me or you know i've got a big shelf up the top of all the books i've still got to read and they're haunting me i'm like, oh, i've got to read you soon you know <laughs> um but yeah i really 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 enjoy it but it is a tough thing it's it's building a muscle and you've got to you've got to slowly sort of build that that routine and that discipline yeah especially that the the new book smell right like when you open it's it's good <laughs> it's kind of addictive <laughs> That's why I keep on buying. I, I keep on buying all the books, like especially because I collect mostly the biographies. I don't really like fiction. I like like biographies, especially like musicians and popular people, Elon Musk and all these guys. And whenever I buy, I, I buy all, all those like, you know, the guy from Amazon, you know, <laughs> all these books. But maybe I need to do that two page thing as well. So that's yeah, probably yeah, where it's <laughs> You have to start small. <laughs> small and, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it's it's just it's about creating the habit. Like if you can create the habit, it doesn't matter whether you do a small thing every day or a large thing, it doesn't matter. It's the consistency of just doing it every day. It's a ritual, you know, and you've got to you gotta start very small. So yeah, give it a shot. Who knows? Who knows? Right, right. Um so uh as I said, I, I came to Sydney in 2016 and I saw this band called the Bastardizer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so Chris Beasley's band. So you know those guys. And then uh, I, I've been, I, and also these pop punk guys like Cambridge and Tonight Alive and all these other pop punk guys because they they toured in the Philippines. Uh, and I've been like, and and some of these guys actually came on my podcast. I talked to them on my podcast because we had a very good connection with them. Um, so so tell me about the Andy Social podcast. So what 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 are you really trying to do from that podcast? And tell me a little bit about the guests you had, some some exciting episodes. Yeah. Um, I still don't know why I do the podcast. It's a weird <laughs> one after all these years. Uh, I think when I first started, um, I thought it'd be a really sneaky way to promote the band, like to promote Lord. I'd have this podcast and people were like, oh, I'm going to check out Lord and, and really enjoy it. But um, I quickly realized that, there was, there was something more exciting to me than just, I don't know, just having a podcast. It was, it was having the opportunity to talk to people I'd never spoken to before or speaking to people that I've known for a long time, but never had a real conversation with them. Right. And I'm sure like, you know, when you've gone to shows and you see a friend and you're like, Oh, Hey, how you doing? And you might have a drink or something like that. Or, you know, you're getting ready to see the show, but you, you don't have a, like a deep conversation because there's lots of noise. There's other people around. And for a lot of my friends, that's, that's been our friendships for years. We just see each other at shows and just pass each other by and have a quick, quick chat. And that's about it. So when I did these podcasts, I was finding that when I was speaking to friends of mine, I was like, oh, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And it was just really, it was kind of embarrassing to begin with. Cause I'm thinking I should know more about you. You're, you're my friend. But um, I just found it was just such a great way to learn more about the people that I had met and, and um, had 
developed friendships with over the years. And then after that, it extended. I just wanted to start finding interesting people. So um, I've had, you know, I guess from, from the metal world, like, you know, on the nod to the old school podcast, I had like David Ellison from Megadeth and Andy LaRock from King Diamond and um, uh, um, Johnny D from Doro and Brittany Fox. And he's been on Andy social as well. Um, Andrew Farris from in excess has been on the mm-hmm. podcast as well. And, um, but then lots of, lots of really interesting people that I'd never expect to talk to like, um, uh, paleontologists and neuroscientists and mathematicians, mathematics, uh, math, math teachers, mathematicians, um, you know, young scientists who are inventing things uh, and um, just authors, you know, and, and comedians, lots of comedians as well. And just basically it got to a point where I'm just constantly like, you know, I'd be scrolling on my phone, but I'm looking for interesting people. And suddenly it's like, right. oh, right. I've got to have that person on the podcast. I've got to have that person. So <laughs> you know, I've got my little notebooks and, and pages of, of names and lists of people that I want to have on you know, in the future. And, and I think for me, it's, it's evolved. Like I've been doing it since 2015 and I've, uh, I've released just over 300 episodes on Andy social. And I think it's, it's helped me get better as a person. I've learned a lot more. I'm more open-minded and more compassionate because I learn about other people's stories. Um, I think I'm better at having a conversation as well. And I think, just hearing from other people who listen to the podcast. I think a lot of other people have learned a lot by listening to other conversations and learn more about the world around them. Or maybe there's things that they are worried about that they only experienced themselves like mental health topics. And then they listen to somebody on the podcast who's had the same experiences and suddenly they feel a little bit better. They don't feel so alone anymore. And so there've been like things that were unexpected that have come out of it. So I think now for me, I'm trying to find like the most interesting people um, that I find interesting. Um, I want to get better as a person. And then I hope as a result of that, the people that listen to the podcast also learn something and, and, and are either entertained or they're enriched and fulfilled and, and get some value out of, out of uh, these conversations. So it's been a wild ride. I'm sure you've been experiencing it as well with your podcast, uh, just some really, really fun, cool conversations with some amazing people. Yeah. And, and the way I look at it, podcast is, it's not really just like just listening to the news where you get some some facts or something it's it's you're getting something but you're getting a perspective of somebody right their their opinions the 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 way they think which which might be totally different from what you would experience so so it might be somebody making fun of something or you know comedians or something so so i really love those listening to that like i i would listen to those like because sometimes those, those like Joe Rogan podcasts that they have like five hour episodes, right? I, I, I listen to the whole five hours, like, <laughs> because it's, yeah. it's so ex- amazing how they, yeah, I, I had some great experiences. I, I was able to interview this um, person called Muruga drama, Muruga Buka. He's a drummer. He played on the first Woodstock in 1969. Wow. So, so he told me all the experience. He played on the day one, right, of Woodstock. So he told me, all the experience of going to the venue and all the experience he had. And this, there was this Swami Swachananda who was doing like the, the, the guru guy and, and how he met him and all this experience and he's doing all the drugs and stuff. So he shared all that. And I feel that I did a service of like preserving that conversation because somebody else can really experience that later on. Right. Because these are, these things are, People don't really talk about these things, right? So that was one thing. And then I'm originally from Sri Lanka. So I, what I did once my podcast got established, I went back to Sri Lanka and I started talking to the older artists that, uh, you know, the Thank artists you. that I, I loved, I loved the songs. And, and the thing I found out is that those guys didn't have a single interview on the internet about them. So, so I, I'm trying to put their story so that at least something is there for them, right? So they're, they're telling about what they experienced, all these amazing things that they did. So, so that, that's where I really found the purpose of doing the podcast. I, I love that. I think that's, that's great. And I found a little bit of that myself, especially with the Australian metal scene. Um, there's been, I've had a lot of uh, musicians on the podcast who were in bands in the 80s and the 90s. Right. And there's not really many interviews from them. 
And those stories are like, I know a lot of the stories because I hear them being talked about at shows. But if I was new to music or new to Australian metal, I wouldn't know unless I knew those per- people personally. And for me, I found that I, and not deliberately, but over the years, I found that I was actually documenting a lot of the Australian metal history. Because right. Putting these people, they're telling their stories about what they did in the, in the eighties and the nineties. And, and it was amazing. And I, I found that people have re- reached out to me and they're using these as references to try and document other things. And I thought that was so cool. And the other thing about which you've jogged my memory is that I think it's just really important to, to allow people to talk and, and share a story. And, you know, some I've, you know, unfortunately we, we were all going to pass away. We're all going to die at some point. And unfortunately there's been a few people that I've had in my podcast who have since passed away. Right. But, but they've left, a, I mean, they've left a lot. They've left a lot with their families and, and all the impact that they've done in their life. But they've also left me with a story, a conversation that's recorded. It's still available. And at any stage, someone can go back and have a listen to that while that person was still alive. And not that I'm trying to find people who are about to die, but right. you know, I think it's great for, for everyone to have an opportunity to share their story and to leave something for maybe their friends and their family to be able to say, hey, this is my life. This is what I did. These are the things I loved and were passionate about. And, um, and there were things I never expected to do when I started podcasting, but I, I definitely found it later on down the track. So yeah, what you're doing, going back to Sri Lanka, and kind of documenting a little bit of it, like giving these artists, these amazing artists that you loved growing up a chance to tell their story. I think that's really powerful. It's, it's very exciting. Yeah, actually podcast, this, doing this podcast actually uh, build that interest of like, you know, in music history for me that I'm actually considering taking formal education on music history, actually. That's cool. Yeah. So, because I mean, I lived the rock and roll, right? So that's basically the thing. So I, you know, get a bit of pieces. Maybe it's time to like do it formally and try to learn everything. And then I can put my experience in there and it will be more valuable, right? It's a great idea. It's a great idea. So Andy, I want to ask you about these crazy talk episodes you do in Andy Social. <laughs> yeah, so crazy talk is basically me talking to myself. So that's the craziness, you know, and it all started um, for a few years. I was living uh, about two hours South of Sydney down, down the coast. And I would find that I was uh, a number of times every week I was driving up to Sydney. Um, And so that's two hours each way. It's a long time in the car. And so I was listening to podcasts and doing things, but I was finding that I was trying to, um, I was trying to use the time to be productive and to think things through. And, and I think we all, well, maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of people talk to themselves. Like they talk things out, their problems. Yep. And, they, and so I found myself recording them and I was recording them for myself. Um, not really thinking that I'd do anything with them, but eventually I thought I'll just put them out on YouTube to begin with. And a few people can listen. And I found that a few people were, and they, they thought it was funny, but um, I started doing that with Andy social every once in a while and adding in the odd crazy talk episode. And I found it was, it was a bit of fun. I could be a bit silly, tell some jokes and some, some silly stuff in, in those episodes. And I could talk about the things that I'm reading or the things that I'm listening to, or I could uh, plug um, some music or some books or something that friends were doing or what, you know, something that I could talk about the stuff that I love to, to talk about. So um, it's very selfish. It's very self-indulgent. And at times I sound very loopy because I'm just talking to myself into a microphone. Um, and so that's why it's called crazy talk. So yeah, it's been, been a bit of fun to, to do that. And I think it's a nice outlet for me where, where with Andy social, I'm mostly talking to other people. So I'm learning a lot, but I think with the crazy talk, I, I get to sort of take all that information and try and talk it through myself. And I think for some people, they find it quite amusing. Right, right. Um, so Andy, I, I actually went and listened to some of the Lord Lord music, right, on on Spotify. And uh, I mean, when I check your Metal Archives p- profile, I, oh my God, there's so much music, right? So many albums, so many EPs. Uh, the the last one, like in 2019, you had that Fallen Idols, which which I like, like Kilo Be Killed, United. Actually, United 
that song reminds me of like Judas Priest Painkiller, like the start <laughs> of it, right? Um, but I, the one that I want to talk about is the undercover volume one, the way you guys did these covers of, I wouldn't even, you guys even covered Savage Garden, right? <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did. It's kind of like our garage days in a way. <laughs> right. So, so tell me about undercover volume one. Yeah, yeah. So um, right from the early days of Dungeon through to Lord Now, we've always loved cover songs. Uh, so they were always great things to put into a live show. Um, you know, towards the end of the set, it was a bit of fun and a song that the crowd would be familiar with. And so we'd play, oh, it could be anything, but it could be Iron Maiden or Judas Priest or something like that. Um, and then every once in a while, we would uh, record um, some covers and they'd be used for bonus tracks. Um, mostly for, for places like Japan. Japan were always really strict about needing bonus tracks um, for their Japanese releases. So it was almost like a mandatory thing. Like if you're going to release an album in Japan, we need bonus tracks with it. Okay, we'll record covers. Right. And, um, and then we also used to record covers before we would record an album. And that was to test all the gear, test the sounds and make sure everything's right. So we use like a beta test uh, to record. And rather than sort of, trying to record a song that we're trying to learn or an old song of ours, we would record a cover and just see what it sounds like. And then we just put it into the archives and just, you know, put it away for a rainy day. And so years and years later, you know, we would always have questions from, you know, the people that listen to our music saying, um, you know, where can I hear this cover that you guys did 10 years ago? Or where can I hear this song? Where can I hear? And we're like, Oh, that one's on, that one's on a, a Japanese release. I think it's out of press now. That one was on an EP, but that was limited edition. That's long gone now. That one never, was never properly released. And so they were everywhere. They were scattered all over the place. So um, last year we thought, why not put a compilation out of all the covers that we've done, most of them that we've done up, uh, up until that point. And uh, it ended up coming out this year. And so it's Undercovers Volume 1. And Volume 1 meaning more than likely there'll be more cover songs in the future. We can't help ourselves. Right. And um, the Bandcamp release has got 23 songs. And then we've got a CD version and then Spotify thinks got eight or 10 songs. So not all of them, but a selection of them. And yeah, we've got um, the Savage Garden cover of To the Moon and Back. And right. we've got uh, Kylie Minogue on a night like this. But then we've got, um, uh, geez, we've got uh, Judas Priest's Reckless. We've got Iron Maiden, Judas Be My Guide. Uh, Wasp, Wild Child, The Whisper by Queensryche, I Want Out by Halloween and Someone's Crying by Halloween. Uh, so we've got a lot of pop, rock and metal in there. And they're just all bands that we grew up with and loved. And, we're, and we just love playing, playing these songs. And so um, we put it out uh, earlier this year and it went really well. It, like, it, we had no idea what to expect. We just thought it would be a little bit of a something to release during the pandemic just to keep it going. And, uh, but it went really well. We got into the, into the Australian music charts here and, um, and we had a lot of success from, from the release. So we were very surprised, but a lot of fun. And, um, I think, I think, uh, there'll be, a, there'll be a, a small amount of time before we start doing more covers again. I think we need to do some original music because we've exhausted our covers for, for the time. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was a really fun project. Really fun. Yeah. Also the also the police one the message in a bottle that version is really nice right I think it's one of the most popular songs also right yeah a lot of a lot of people really like that like that one and it's it's surprising because it's it's a song that's covered by so many different artists I mean there's been a lot of metal bands that have covered it I know Blind Guardian I'm pretty sure Blind Guardian have um, uh, Machine Head have um, and but it's been a very popular song to cover so for when we re recorded it I didn't expect it to be that popular because it's been done so many times, but um, right. people really love it. And no complaints from me. It's great. It's fantastic. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely loving the fact that people really enjoy it. So yeah, it's cool. Right. So you, you mentioned about the Japanese versions of, you know, I know because that's the reason I really love buying the Japanese editions uh, because they, they, they have the bonus tracks and they, they have the lyric book, lyrics sometimes, which normal album doesn't have. And even the CD, is it's actually heavy right than the regular one the japanese one quality. yeah the quality is so high uh, how's your experience in have you have you toured in japan as well how's the experience touring in japan uh it's um it's amazing 
it's it's incredible. Uh, we we've been really lucky. Uh, Dungeon uh, released. Uh, uh, it, was, it was it was kind of an album. It was more like a, a collection of demo songs that accidentally got released in Japan. They thought they thought it was a final thing and ended up releasing. It was called Demolition, and uh, it became really popular in Japan in the mid nineties. And since then, Dungeon sort of created a bit of a presence in Japan, and they played there in I think two thousand and two or two thousand and three for the first time, and then. Not long after that, I think they came back in 05 and I was there with them. And then Lords sort of picked up the momentum and kept going. And we've we played in Japan, I think, five or six times. And I've been there personally, like, I don't know, I've, I've lost count. I love the place. I've got a lot of friends there now that I've built friendships with. And um, it's such a it's such an amazing place. It's I think they're very, they're very isolated. They're very protective of their culture. And when you go there, it's like going to another planet especially right. for australia like you know we're so we're so westernized and i think japan is more westernized now but i think when you go there it's, it's a big culture shock for an australian to go to japan and i just fell in love with the place and playing there is so unique because shows would start really early and it didn't matter like whether it was on the weekend or during the week people were coming from work because people just work all the time over there they're just, just crazy yeah. like they're just obsessed and, you know, I remember like playing like a, one particular tour, we were playing in Tokyo and they had the little curtain in front of the stage and the curtain opened and I'm looking out and the pack room looks great, but the front row, and then I'm seeing them scattered all the way through is uh, Japanese men in business shirts with black ties. They've just come from work. Right. And, and I'm looking going, these aren't metal heads. Like these are just, these are people you'd see in an office building. And they've got their, they've loosened up their tie a bit and they're all polite and they're clapping. And so we start playing and they go crazy. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And it was such a weird thing to see because we're, I mean, I'm sure you've been the same when you go to shows. You're used to seeing people that look like us, you know, or beards hey, hey. or the long hair or the black t shirts. And here were these businessmen who, in some cases, there was a barrier. They had their briefcase, they put it down in front of the barrier so they could hey. rock, rock, rock out. <laughs> And so that was really cool. And the other really unique thing about Japan that I found was you would play your song and then you finish and anywhere else in the world or most places in the world, there'd be people yelling and whistling or clapping. And what the Japanese would do often is that you'd finish a song and they clap and then they, they probably yell out a bit and then they go dead silent, like so quiet. And you could hear like crickets. Like it was just that quiet. And right. First time it happened, I'm looking at the rest of the guys. I'm thinking, uh oh, what have we done? Like, oh, they don't like us, you know? And then we realize that the reason why they're so quiet is that they're being polite and they don't want to interrupt if we're going to say something to the crowd. If we if we're going to talk to them, right. they don't want to be inter- uh, they, they don't want to interrupt us. So it's their their culture to be quiet. And so it was so weird. So we had to, I attempted to speak in English. They couldn't understand a lot of what I was saying. So it was like this awkward sort of <laughs> sort of laughing. And then eventually I, I was trying to speak in Japanese and they were laughing at me. So I thought, oh, okay, all right. And then eventually it got to a point where we would just yell out, Tokyo! And then they would all go, yeah! And I'm like, oh, that's it. That's all we need to do. Awesome. So we would yell something out in Japanese, yell out where we're, where we're playing, and that was great. And then we'd kick into the next song really quickly. And um and then nowhere else in the world was like that. It was just such a unique place. But um, yeah, I've got a real affection for that country. It's uh, It's been great. And there's a great history of rock and metal bands playing there. Lots of great live albums that are recorded in Japan. And I think from a music collector point of view, like anyone who buys CDs and records, um, that's still the place to go. I mean, their secondhand music stores, their, their disc unions, their, um, you know, all their... Um, you know, even Tower Records and HMV is still over there and just the amazing music shopping over there. It's just incredible. It's so cool. Right. How, how about in, in, in Australia? Do you still have uh, music shops? I remember one in, uh, I think it's the Hi-Fi one in North Sydney. I remember the, the yellow shop. I yeah. remember going there. Yeah, yeah. But- we, still, we still got them. Uh, JB Hi-Fi. Yeah, they're all over the country. Yeah. So. Um, the music sections are getting smaller and smaller because they sell other things as well. Um, but yeah, there's not as many music stores as there used to be. And that, and that's, it's tough. Um, we do have some really good stores still in, in Australia. And in Sydney, we've got a place called Utopia Records and they've been 
they've been around since the late seventies, I think 1978, they opened and they're still running now and really successful. And it's more or less like it'd be 95% heavy metal. And the other 5% would be like punk and, and some hard rock and stuff like that. Uh, an amazing place. And people from all over the world, when they come to Australia, actually go to Utopia to go and you know, go and do some shopping there and buy some, buy some metal records or some CDs or whatever it is. And, and uh, so that's, that's one of our most important places. There are some other sh- stores around, uh, around the country, a bit smaller. And we've got some good online ones as well that have popped up. But um, the old school record store, unfortunately, is not, it's not as many as what they used to be, which is a, which, which is a real shame. Right. Because I remember going there. In, I, I went to the JV uh, Hi-Fi in North Sydney because I went and bought this, you know, the Australian band uh, Parkway Drive? Yeah, yeah. Great because the, 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 the last Blu-ray they released, actually, I'm in that video. So like oh, one really? of the... Yeah, yeah, I mean one of the scenes. So, so I, I went and bought a copy of that, and then, and then I showed it to the, 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 the girl who was like the, the, there, and then she actually had a Parkway Drive tattoo, oh, <laughs> and I took a picture with her on that shop. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so, cool. Uh, so Andy, with the, uh, you know, when you're talking about all this experience in Japan and all that, now that, I mean, right now you, while you guys cannot yet to her and all that so what are you looking forward uh, to the next year maybe next year and year beyond and what's happening with load what can we expect from load yeah um as i said earlier we we got really surprised this year with the with the covers album it went really it was really successful and i think for us it's it's funny after so many years of us being in a band and touring and releasing music and um, to see like Fallen Idols was the first album that we actually got in the Australian music charts and then Undercovers just got even, it went even better. So for us, we're trying to think, okay, we need to keep that momentum going. So we're, we're writing music at the moment and some original music and we're, we're working out what we want to do. Like, do we want to release it as an album? Do we want to do something a little bit different? Um, there's there's a, lot of, a lot of music that we've got planned. Uh, so I think the thing that's guaranteed is definitely there's more Lord music coming and that'll come uh, in the new year in, in 2022. Um, touring. Um, I would love to get out as soon as possible and play. Um, don't know at the moment though. The, the world is very unpredictable as, as we all know. And you know, when you think things are starting to get better then they, it goes backwards and you're like, Oh man. And I've seen so many friends lose lots of money and have to cancel tours and, and for us, I just don't think it's a, a good time at this stage to, to be investing a lot of money to tour overseas and, and in some ways, in, even in Australia at the moment. So I think we'll focus on music, um, getting as much new stuff recorded as we can. And then hopefully by that stage, things will be a little bit better and we can, we can get back out and play some shows again. It's been, it's been a long time since we've played. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I think um, while that all happens, I think... You know, the Andy Social Podcast is going to keep going, and I'm going to continue to talk to all my heavy metal mates and and all the other weird and wonderful characters that I meet in my travels, and try to try to sort of um, have these worlds working at the same time. And uh, I think I think next year is going to be really busy for a lot of people. I think as things get better, I think people are going to be motivated to get back out and and do lots of fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody does. Right. Right. Hopefully, you know, you guys can tour here also, like in Manila, maybe, because it's very near, right? <laughs> well, and I I would absolutely love to play in Manila. And I think um, some friends of ours, God, Gods of Eden, yeah. I think played played there. And um, I've, we've, so in Southeast Asia, we played in Indonesia, we played in uh, Malaysia uh, and Singapore. I think that might be it. And then we've obviously gone to Japan to play, which is not Southeast Asia, but um, I'd love to play the Philippines. I'd love to love to go to Thailand, Vietnam. I'd love to sort of, you know, just do that whole region and like just do a proper tour and mm-hmm. it'd be so much fun. And I think anywhere we haven't been for the first time is so exciting. Uh, it's just so exciting. And I'd love, it blows my mind to know that there's people in Manila that love metal. Um, it's so exciting. And for me, it just, it makes me want to just, do whatever I can to get there and play. I think that'd be so cool. Oh man. 
Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Andy, uh, I actually found your profile on the Discogs website. Oh yeah. You, you have a Discog profile, right? And you have 4,500 plus listings there, right? <laughs> I've got a lot of music, man. I've got a lot of music. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to upload as well. So I think I, I, I think I got maybe around 1,500 uh, catalogs so far. I think one thing on the pandemic helped is I was able to have time to actually do the, while, I, while I'm doing like work, I'm doing a Zoom call while I'll be just sorting while I'm talking in the meeting, I'll be just sorting the CDs and, you know, the vinyls and, and you know, changing the sleeves. And uh, so that was something, but I still, I still have stuff that, the, the problem is when you can't find that version on, on Discogs, you're lazy to put it in. So you just <laughs> leave it, right? <laughs> I, what I would do is I would have, because I found a lot of Australian music wasn't on there. Um, to begin with, because I've been using it for a few years now. And so what I would do, um, very similar to you, is I would have like, you know, I'd be working and I'd have like a pile of CDs next to me. And so these would be the ones that have already catalogued. And then I'd have another pile of the ones that aren't even on Discogs yet. And then slowly months over months, I would grab one CD off and then I'd go and just type it in and add the, add the details in. And that was my way of sort of contributing to it. It right. was sort of, it was like, the documenting of music, you know, you want it to exist. You want people to be able to know that it exists. And I love Discogs because it's a great way for me to know, to remember what's in my collection. So as I said, Japan's amazing for music. So what I would do is go through these amazing stores and I'd have my phone with the Discogs app, just double checking to make sure I don't already have that version, you know, because I'd come home sometimes with the same, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I do that also. I buy the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And so it's been really good for your own collection. Um, and I use it to sell as well. So stuff I, I, I sell from time to time. So that's been really good. And I think it's just a great way. It's a great educational tool to learn about music, to learn about what releases a band has put out and the different versions. And, and it's just, it's fascinating to like, I always discover new bands and I'll go to Discogs and I'll just see what else are they released. And that helps me, find them on Spotify or it helps me you know, go to the marketplace and actually go and buy one of the CDs or if the band's still active, go to their band camp or their official store and buy, buy the release as well. So it's a, it's an amazing place. It's so addictive. Oh, like I could spend hours in there and I'm just like, where's the day gone? That's <laughs> I just spend a lot of time. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> so, so Andy, what's your message to the viewers of this video and people who's going to listen to this podcast? episode oh thanks so much for listening uh like just listening to me especially if you're if you're not familiar with me or, or lord um it's nice to it's nice to connect with so many people listening if, even though i don't know who you all are um i just if you if you listen to to this podcast then you obviously love podcasts so definitely come and check out mine um but at the very least, come and say hi. Like, find me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever. I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm on all, all the social media platforms. And say hello. I love connecting with people all around the world and building friendships. And and uh, I think anyone who's who's spent the time to watch us have a chat or, or listen in for, for this period of time, I, I'm truly thankful. And, uh, yeah, just a, a massive thank you for, for showing some interest in, in what my life is all about. Right. So Andy, anybody you want to shout out to? Oh, you want to shout out to? I probably should shout out to my wife because I've been doing podcasts all day and she's in the next room going, <laughs> when's he done? When's he done? So Jess, I'll shout out to Jess, my wife. <laughs> right. So Andy, Andy, thanks for joining this uh, podcast. I really enjoy talking to you and, and I, I'm, I'm really glad that I found you and, yeah. you know, and how we got connected and then I discovered your band, your podcast and, uh, it's really amazing and I wish you all the best with your podcasting and uh, you know and and looking forward Lord in the Philippines hopefully and all the best <laughs> Me too. and it's it's a pleasure connecting with you and let's chat again I'd, I'd absolutely love to chat more and uh, it's just yeah it's great to connect with you thank you Andy have a great evening <laughs> you too. thank you <laughs>